Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where people get exactly what they ask for. Our first Reddit post is from Alabaster. I was living with my girlfriend and a roommate, and we split the cost of every bill evenly, even though each bill was in one person's name. Well, that was the idea, but I naively helped my girlfriend pay her part of the bills, i.e. paid completely for most of them. The rent was in my name, the electricity in my girlfriend's, etc. Well, I eventually got tired of her attitude, arguments, smelly gerbils, not doing her chores, etc. And we broke up. It was messy. She took ages to move out, making sure to mooch every penny she could before leaving. When she left, I immediately started a new electricity account in my name. A week later, I got a letter of confirmation in the mail, but I also received the electricity bill for the last three months my ex was living with us. I opened it without thinking. We couldn't even pay it if we wanted to because the bill was in her name. I shot her a text. Yo, we got your electricity bill in the mail. It's 120 bucks, so come pick up 40 bucks from each of us. Um, where's the other 40? We agreed I wouldn't pay bills after I move out, as if she did before. You were still living here for the time period of the bill. This is BS. I'm not going to pay a thing. We had an agreement. Well, you can come over to get our part or you can pay it alone. The way I see it, you can either bring the $120 to my place or have fun in the dark, lol. <laughs> you got me there. At this point, I realized that she doesn't know I started my own account with the electricity provider. She thought that by refusing to pay, the provider would cut our lights. Good way to mooch another 40 bucks from us, right? But that's not quite what happened. A few weeks later, I received another letter from the electricity company with her name on it. Probably a late payment warning. I sent her a text to tell her and she responded, Lol, why are you so desperate to talk to me? You know what you have to do, smiley face. <laughs> Another letter came in for her. This one was probably late fees. I have to guess because I never opened them. I messaged her and she said, I thought I told you to never talk to me again. As you wish, ma'am. More letters arrived, but from a new address. I googled the new sender's address and found that they were debt collectors. Scary stuff. It's too bad I couldn't say a word to her. Now, <laughs> about two or three months later, I received a phone call from my ex and I'm greeted by, what the F? These people are calling my parents' house. I've got all these late fees, bye, debt collectors. I told her if she wants our part of the bill, she knows what to do, smiley face. Realizing that she had no other choice, she caved and came for the money. My roommate and I didn't give her a cent towards late fees, and I probably looked so freaking smug giving her my money for the last time. If you don't give me money, then I won't pay my bills and rack up massive debt. That'll teach you. Our next Reddit post is from ACFF. Some backstory, I was a general troubleshooter for my company. My job involved a lot of traveling to different cities we support. My area of work is Ontario, Canada, where I'm based out of, and some of the nearby states in my United States, New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, and Pennsylvania. I did most of my traveling by car since my schedule can change quite quickly and flying can become very expensive. I had one colleague who is technically my subordinate, but we have a very good working relationship and would often handle calls independently of each other, only checking in by phone once a week and in person once a month when necessary. A little over a year ago, I get an email calling me to the head office in New York City for a meeting with the CEO and the board of directors regarding my job. I check with my colleague and he got the same email. So we make our travel plans and meet in New York City the following week. We have dinner together the night before our meeting and can't figure out between us what the issue is about. It's rare to get summoned to head office and more rare for things to be so vague. 
When we go into the meeting the next day, we're informed that the company is dividing our department between the US and Canada, and that there would be a new person to deal with the US clients and we were to restrict ourselves to Canada. Both my colleague and I were a little shocked at this, since neither of us has heard that this was being discussed. I asked who the new person for the US was, and we then learned that it was a new hire that the CEO had taken a special interest in. Trying to be a good sport, I offered to train the new person. There are many realities of the job that are not in the job description. The CEO accepted and then brought in the new hire. In walks a young lady who looks about 23 years old and wears an expression like she knows everything. She sits at the table and immediately makes it very clear that she wants nothing to do with us. My CEO is Bob, the new hire is Karen, and my colleague is Jim. Bob says, Welcome, Karen. We have just informed OP and Jim about the change in structure, and they are willing to give you the support you need to get yourself started. Karen and Bob both look at me. Glad to have you aboard, Karen. I think both Jim and I have a lot of experience to share with you, and we are happy to do so. Perhaps it would be better in a separate meeting so we don't take the board's time. Thank you all. I have a lot of ideas about how I can streamline our department and new policies I can introduce that should save the company a lot of money and expenses. I'm very confused at this point. Karen is speaking as though she is my supervisor and that is distinctly not what Bob spoke to us about. I can see some of the board members giving strange looks at this as well. I say, Bob, perhaps I misunderstood the new roles here. Would you please clarify? Sure, Karen is the new head of your department, and both you and Jim will answer directly to her. A board member says, that isn't what we discussed or approved as a board. We weren't fully convinced of dividing the department, but this is completely against what we discussed. What did you discuss then? That your department would be divided between the US and Canada. OP and Jim would remain north of the border and you would run the US. That's not what I was told, but I can work with that. As long as these two stay out of my way, indicating me and Jim. Jim and I are both shocked and insulted to be spoken of in this manner. We're both very good at our jobs and before today have never seen this woman in our lives. That settles it. OP, effective immediately. You and Jim are to have nothing to do with Karen. Do not interfere with her work at all. You are both to restrict yourselves to working within Canada only. With that, he ended the meeting and left the room with Karen close behind him. Jim and I sat there stunned for a moment and some of the board members came up to us to express their shock and sympathies about this. I had enough presence of mind to ask if we would get a written directive of this change and was assured we would. Sure enough, both Jim and I got emails with a new director from Bob by the end of the day. So after sending an email to all our US-based clients advising them of the change and giving them the contact information of Karen, Jim and I made our way back to Toronto and reorganized ourselves for working within Ontario only. This meant much less traveling for us, so it gave us more room to breathe. Within a week, I was getting complaints from our US-based clients that Karen was not answering emails and missing appointments. I forwarded these emails to Karen and copied the entire board, including Bob. Another week later, I get a phone call from Karen who sounds frantic, but will not admit she needs help. She makes pleasant conversation and then asks how I would handle a particular type of situation. I tell her I'm really not interested in discussing work as that might be seen as interfering in her work. <laughs> Later that evening, I get a call from Jim telling me he had the same conversation with Karen and handled it the same way. By the end of that month, I get a call from Bob asking if I will take over the entire department again. I politely tell him no since I didn't want to interfere with Karen and her role. For the next three months, I'm getting emails and phone calls from US clients asking if they can have me back as their contact. This confirms an idea that had been in my head. Jim and I had actually grown our client base in Ontario since restricting ourselves here. So I had lunch with Jim one day and asked him if he wanted to go into business with me as partners starting our own consulting firm. 
We couldn't provide everything our current company provided, but we could provide a high degree of professionalism for our specific field, and it seemed we had a ready-made client base. By the end of the lunch, he was on board and we started the necessary steps to get ourselves set up. As soon as we were clear, we both submitted our resignations with explanations of why. The next time clients contacted us, we told them we no longer worked for the company. When they asked if we still worked in the field, we told them we had established our own firm and what services we offered. A month later, we had 60% of our US clients on board. And since the former company had no Canadian support at all, we had 80% of the Canadian clients. Within two months, we had 80% of the US and 90% of the Canadian clients. In the year since that time, our new company has grown enough that we have hired seven new consultants. Jim and I find ourselves doing more office work than road work and a lot of client courting. Our old company has had to stop offering the in-person troubleshooting, which is what our department did. And Bob was fired by the board. No idea what happened to Karen. Update. Because of the interest expressed in the comments, I made a phone call to one of the board members I remained on friendly terms with. Here are some answers to questions. How did Karen get the job? Apparently, Bob had set up a business school scholarship out of his own money, which had put something like six or seven students through business school. Karen was the latest graduate and Bob wanted to give her a start in the business world. Was Bob sleeping with Karen? No clear answer was given. But Bob's wife divorced him shortly after he was fired from the company. Make of that what you will. What happened to Karen? Apparently, she got a job as middle management in a financial services company. Hopefully, she can still build a life for herself and has learned some important lessons. What happened to Bob? Last I heard, he was a regional director for a large hotel chain. Hopefully, he also lands on his feet. Everyone deserves a chance to make a life for themselves. Some question why the board was there for this meeting. I honestly don't know, and neither did the board member I spoke with. It was one of their regularly scheduled meetings and Bob added things to the agenda. Man, this story could have so easily ended differently. If the CEO hadn't divided the two districts, then we've all read enough stories about Karen's to know that her incompetence would have constantly been blamed on OP and Jim. Then they would have gotten fired and she probably would have gotten promoted. Our next Reddit post is from Sam Unseen. Last September, my wife had planned a wonderful Father's Day present for me. Father's Day is in September in Australia. This was to be my first ever Father's Day as a new dad. So to mark the occasion, my wife had arranged to have our daughter's face laser etched onto a dog tag. However, the day before Father's Day, she received the item back and it was, shall we say, subpar. So she came to me and showed me my present early. <laughs> for, for those who are listening and not watching, this picture of this baby's face looks like something out of The Exorcist. <laughs> it's like this creepy baby face with like glowing white eyes. It's not something you'd want to wear on your body at all. <laughs> now, I've had some experience with sucky retailers before and remembered to always come prepared when disputing the quality of goods and services. So I set my phone to record all audio and approached the retailer. I explained that my wife was upset at the quality of the engraving and rightfully so. I requested a refund and was immediately met with resistance. To begin with, they blamed the quality of the photo we provided. Then when I disputed that, they said that laser engraving doesn't do depth very well and some faces can end up with some shadows missing. End of conversation. They refused a refund and threatened to call security if I didn't leave. The engraver is located in a mall that I also happen to work in. My wife and I left. We straight away left a less than glowing review on their Google page. This was met with accusations of us being unreasonable and threatening violence. Ours was not the only review to which they had this response. They informed us that the matter had been passed on to the local police and that a restraining order had been applied for. We immediately called all local police stations and were delighted to hear that they had never heard of the company in question. After some thought and me being the stubborn bastard that I am, I decided to forward the matter onto the local small claims tribunal. 
A month or so passed, and our day in the tribunal had arrived. We honestly weren't expecting the engraver to show up, but lo and behold, there he was, at a civil claims court in camo pants and a hoodie. We met in a room with a mediator who told us that it may not be worth chasing a $40 refund from someone who is, in short, a dickhead. She warned us that it may end up costing more than the service to begin with. But as mentioned before, I'm a stubborn bastard. We pushed forward, opting to go to hearing. This is when we heard some marvelous news from the engraver. Oh, I'm not prepared to go to hearing today. I haven't got any of my evidence. Ding, ding, ding. We went to a hearing that day. The registrar ruled in our favor and issued a notice of payment. The business was to pay us 40 bucks within two weeks. Two weeks later, no payment, no surprise. During this time, I had been communicating via email with the holder of the engraver's lease, who, in response to my complaint, among many others, had decided to terminate the lease, effectively kicking the engraver out of the mall. My man. While the engraver was organizing a new venue for his business, I filed a motion for a writ for levy of property meaning the local sheriff was able to enter his premises and relieve him of merchandise to the value of the refund plus court fees, now totaling 139 bucks. I informed the engraver, asking him if he would like to settle like a reasonable person or have the sheriff pay him a visit. He was not a reasonable person. Then OP posts a text conversation. He says, just so you know, you owe us $139 due to failure to pay in time for the original order. Would you like to sort this out like a civilized person, or would you prefer I send this sheriff to your new shop to repossess some items to cover the cost? Go for the gold, mate. That's not how the law works. Once the writ had been issued, the fee then increased to 225 bucks. All I had to do was wait. And wait I did, until March 13th this year, when the sheriff finally attended his new business premises. He was offered an ultimatum, pay the fee or have merchandise repossessed. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him, the man paid. He was stubborn for six months over a $40 refund, only to be down 225 bucks plus five bucks interest. That was r slash malicious compliance and if you enjoyed this content, please subscribe to my channel because I am so close to 1 million subs.